So welcome everyone. Um, I think we're going to begin with Leonardo. Thank you, Don. Uh, and welcome everybody. We will present some slides about the experience of, of the SAT uh, curriculum and its link to agriculture. Uh, let me share my screen. And just you, I want to share the whole thing. I have to move this. I do. Huh. It's the other one. It's move over a couple. Yes, I know, but but, but I, I have the, the oh I see the the, the everybody's okay. I found it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. There we go. So before the 70s, there was not education beyond fourth or fifth grade in the rural areas of Colombia. And certainly not for Afro-Colombians. It was the same curriculum taught applied in urban areas. The initial purpose of the research of at Fundae was to generate a curriculum for rural high school education. The church has opposed the teaching of high children classes in Cali, in the slums, in the slums of the misery belt that surround the city. The opportunity then was to direct both of the efforts toward the rural area where the Afro-Colombian population of Calca has shown a high receptivity to the fair. I want to press for you to, let's read this quote. Somebody wants to read it? Don, can you read it, please? Sure. The quote. Among, among other principles, of Bahá'u'lláh's teachings was the harmony of science and religion. Religion must stand the analysis of reason. It must agree with scientific fact and proof so that science will sanction religion and religion fortify science. Both are indissolubly welded and joined in reality. If statements <laughs> and teachings of religion are found to be unreasonable and contrary to science, they are outcomes of superstition and imagination. I do believe that all human beings are capable of looking at the world with science and religion. But what happens if we try to see the world with just one eye? Have you tried to play tennis, ping pong, soccer, or basketball with one eye covered? What happens to our peripheral and deaf perceptions? This is very important for us to understand from the X initiative to develop a curriculum for rural areas, applying science. When Fundaik started, it was very clear that the curriculum implies a search to develop capabilities, not just skills. This is some of the capabilities, but very important on top is having service to the community as the axis, as the axis of the whole curriculum. This is a set of, of faculties, of capabilities, the curriculum contributes to develop. And each one of these potentialities exists in variable degrees in all human beings. By an idea, yeah, by a simple idea, just being beat down. It's beat down so many times. Yes, yes. But the different text, text books are contributing to develop these capabilities, to have an orderly and systematic perception of the world, to be a logical thinker, to be a creative builder of things, 
to be able to analyze systems and processes, to be willing to use mathematical operations, to be able to use formative and qualitative data to describe, to describe the world, to be a good farmer, to be able to maintain your own health and improve communities' health, to be able to participate in the local economy and contribute to improve it, to be able to communicate with others, to be a good reader, a good observer, to be willing to experiment, to be able to rely on science, to comprehend reality and transform it, to feel satisfied performing a trade, to be a good family member, to be organized and a good participant in helping your community to be organized, to be able to, to of using the different methods of science and to be able to appreciate, appreciate and use the artistic expression to transform reality. If you look at the curriculums anywhere in the world, nobody is teaching this. I want you to look at this diagram of Fundai. I was a studying early on when I became a Baha'i 45 years ago, 46 years ago. I realized that the application of Baha'i teachings and scientific principles were interwoven, for example. Learning or the process of building the, capa the capability about reading. Francis de Balcácer, which was, was an anthropologist, developed some courses focusing on reading the reality of families, villages, and farmers, wisdom in having polyculture. This is very important. It's just to read what you can see, what you can observe in your village, in your neighborhood. Nobody's teaching reading like that. Is there anybody teaching this kind of being able to describe the situation of a family, of, of a village, trying to learn to read the reality of that village? That's it. I, I would like for Erin to proceed with what she has to offer about the experience of SAT in Honduras. Let me stop sharing. Erin, you can proceed with your presentation about education. Hey, thank you so much, Leo, for getting us started. I was hoping you would tell us a little bit more about the history of your involvement with Fundec, but maybe we can go back to it when we when we turn to the questions and answers. Yes. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure to meet many of you this morning. I think it's probably the first time we've met. So maybe I'll just start off with a more personal introduction. I really appreciate, Don, the professional introduction that you uh, that you shared about my, my background and my professional background. So um, I'm joining you this morning from Berkeley, California. And I apologize if you start to hear lots of dog barking, et cetera. Normally my Sunday involves a nice long walk with my, with my dogs and we're having a super bloom right now in California. <laughs> I'm very excited to, uh, to hit the trails later and the dogs are excited as well. So I apologize in advance if that happens. Um, so as Don mentioned, I've been involved in, uh, in the past 20 years or so with an ongoing program of research, uh, looking more specifically at the educational components uh, in, you know, squarely in the field of comparative and international education. So I actually grew up in Massachusetts and did um, my undergraduate work in Massachusetts and then went as a master's student in 1998 to, the, to Oxford University. And <clears throat> the backstory, is that uh, it was at that time that Michael Richards, who I'm actually filling in for today, I should say. So uh, I'm sure many of you know Michael and I know he's an active part of this group. So he is on an airplane right now. And so he couldn't actually present, but I think the initial plan was that Michael was going to tell you a bit about agriculture in the SAT program. 
And he reached out to me a few weeks ago and said, Aaron, do you think you could fill in for me? Because I really want to make sure this group hears about SAT. And I said, of course, Michael, because I always say that he gets all the credit for luring me into this program of research uh, to begin with. So 20 years ago, as a master's uh, student at Oxford, Michael actually said, Aaron, you're interested in education and you have this interest in girls and gender and empowerment. Can you go to Honduras for a week? And I said, sure. Um, he said, you know, we have this grant from the UK Department for International Development. We got some funding. This was the Baha'i Agency for Social and Economic Development in 1996, actually. Um, they, uh, they got some funding. And um, they they started this experiment again on the North Coast. And there's, there, there's a whole, I think it's actually a fascinating backstory here. Um, so I can I can share more of the details about it, but the um, the short shorter version of this long story is that um, Michael and his colleagues at Base UK successfully got some funding from the UK Department for International Development to begin to experiment with this innovative program that Fundaec ha had begun in Colombia in uh, on the north coast of Honduras. So today I'm going to tell you a bit about. Um, that in, that experience in Honduras, and with the full disclosure that I am not an, a specialist in agriculture. So my areas of interest are actually, as Don mentioned, I've studied um, women's empowerment through the SAT program. Uh, I have studied what we think of as like life skills and how do we conceptualize life skills. Much of my work is theoretical, thinking about what are these concepts and how can we understand them. But I have this incredible case study through which to explore these questions. And that case study is the SAT program in Honduras. So I haven't personally done a lot of uh, research or actually really any research re related to the agricultural component of SAT, but it is within everything that SAT does. So while it hasn't been my explicit focus, one cannot study SAT without studying agriculture. So I'll share my screen. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. You can raise your physical hand or your virtual hand, and I'll do my best to answer those questions. Um, or we can also put questions in the chat. I'm happy for you to use the chat function. I'm not a great multitasker, but I like to uh, practice my multitasking skills. So if I see a hand raised, uh, I will de definitely try to pause and take some questions. I know at this time of the uh, year, if, for those of us who work in academic settings, we already have a very low bandwidth for more presentations and more uh, people talking at us. So I'll try to turn off my screen share from time to time just to make sure uh, that no one has fallen asleep. Um, but hopefully with this time of day, at least in California, it's still early. So I'm, I'm still uh, feeling lots of energy and I hope to share that energy and enthusiasm with you about this uh, really fascinating experience that has unfolded in Honduras over the last uh, 20 years or so. Dawn, how does the screen share look? Is it okay? It looks great. Perfect. Okay, so I've already told a little bit of this history of SAT in Honduras. Um, as I mentioned, it got uh, funding from Based UK in 1996 for a pilot initiative. And then we see this expansion of the SAT program in uh, from the 20, 2000s to the 2010s. So I need to I need to say a little bit more about what is SAT and why why is it so innovative in terms of um, education. So Leo already shared some of these really interesting um, components in his long list. And, and there's really a lot that one could say here, but essentially Fundayek in the uh, 70s and 80s, when you know Leo was working with them, tried to understand what is it that youth need in order to be able to make a meaningful contribution to the development of their communities. And they focused on these capability areas and Leo read those capability areas. And that resulted in the creation of textbooks and, um, and those, actually, I shouldn't even say textbooks. I should say workbooks. We use the term um, textbook in, in English, but 
really these are interactive workbooks that were designed around capability areas. So there are um, these core capability areas, science, technology, as it is appropriate in rural areas, which is really agriculture in this context, mathematics, language and communication, and then the axis around which everything is organized is community service. And SAD has a very strong experiential and applied focus. So this um, is very different from how we normally see the organization of secondary schools in Central America and in Latin America and in North America, um, where we have these traditional subject areas. Sometimes there's as many as 10, sometimes there's as many as 14, where we divide knowledge into these different kind of really false categories. Um, and Funda came and said, no, like that's um, not really the way in which we can allow these youth to build their capabilities. So as you know, the in, in Colombia, this was created initially as a non-formal education program, but over time, the Colombian government recognized this as an alternative secondary education program. And then when it was brought to Honduras is actually where we see the strongest example of the formalization of the SAT program in Latin America, um, it received full recognition from the Secretary of Education or the Ministry of Education in Honduras in the early 2000s. Um, it is really thought of as a public-private partnership. So there's a Baha'i-inspired organization that's called Asociación Bayan. They're based on the north coast of Honduras. They're a non-governmental organization. They are the ones who help with this innovative system of tutor recruitment, training, and professional development. So for those of you on this call, you're probably not surprised that they use the word tutor. Um, the tutor is this concept of someone who can guide a process of learning, but not someone that's filling you with information, more of a facilitator. Um, the SAT program and the RUHI uh, program came about at a similar stage in time, and there was a lot of shared learning between these two um, really interesting initiatives that came out of Fundac. They continue to use the word tutor, not teacher, um, in this program to really distinguish uh, this new idea of what a tutor is. There's a lot of other um, aspects that make this program innovative. Uh, but those are just a few that I think are really important to mention just to give um, you a bit of an idea of what it is. So essentially what you can um, what you can think of is that this program is one of many in Latin America that have been identified as an innovative way to reach rural youth with secondary education. So in North America, the grades, are seven to 12. So we think of this as middle school and high school. So it's an alternative program, but it's a formal program. At the end of it, students receive their high school diploma. So my work um, studying the SAT program actually began with this trip that I that Michael Richards sent me on where I looked at girls and women's empowerment through the program. Um, and then I actually decided to do my PhD dissertation on the SAT program and wound up publishing a book. Oh, you know, actually, give me one second, because as I'm presenting these slides, I wanted to share them with you. Um, and I can do that through the chat. So let me, uh, sorry that I forgot to do that earlier. Um, I'm going to send the slides because I want you to be able to look on with me and also to let you know that there's a number of hyperlinks within the slides themselves. So if you go to the first slide, you'll see um, that the hyperlink is to my website. Um, and so the website has a lot of the other publications that I'll mention throughout the day, more information about the research that I've conducted and then other hyperlinks later in the presentation have, um, have links to additional uh, resources. So hopefully that this, I see a bunch of you already on those slides. So you can feel free to follow along or um, you know, do your own thing with these slides and begin to explore some of those, uh, those some of those resources. And um, hopefully what I what I think is this is a this is an appetizer for you all. I'm just giving you a small taste of what is sat. And hopefully the additional resources that I flagged today are really the ones that you can use to learn more about the SAT program. Um, because there's a lot to learn. I mean, just, and you know, as Leo is saying, 
there's, there's so much to say that we can really only give you just a very brief introduction today. So um, my career, I started with this PhD dissertation. It was on uh, women's empowerment. Hopefully the share is working again. You see the slide, John? Yeah, okay, great. So um, so that was the PhD dissertation. And then I, I published a book about SAT and women's empowerment. But as I was doing that work, I really wanted to better understand, okay, so we know that this program is um is an, a kind of interesting one to study the context of women's empowerment. But what happens when we compare it to traditional models of secondary school? What do we know about the quality? What do we know about whether or not students are um you know can do well on what we would think of as traditional measures of academic outcomes or educational quality? So um luckily I was able to get funding to do an impact evaluation of the SAT program. This was a very um, extensive study. So we got one round of funding in 2007, and that uh, that first stage of the study went through to 2010, and then we got another round of funding in 2016. And the research design was what we call a quasi-experiment. So we actually compared two systems of rural education. We compared the SAT program and the traditional model of secondary schools in, in rural Honduras, which are called the SEBs. And so um, the SAT program has these innovative um, you know, components with these participatory texts that are facilitated by their tutor. Um, they get all this training from the um, Bayan Association. One tutor stays with the cohort throughout their schooling, so from seventh to twelfth grade. Um, and then there's a, a, a specific um, kind of model for tutor testing, monitoring, and accountability, which is very interesting and very innovative in the context of um, Central American education. And that compares with these traditional schools, which have texts and lectures, very much a kind of chalk and talk pedagogy, not very much innovation happening there. Um, we could think of them as traditional schools. So we were able to create a sample within these um, two. We had about 100 total um, uh, communities in this quasi-experiment where we matched uh, a sample of primary schools that were feeding into the SAT program and these um, SEBs. And then we did a baseline survey. We did an assessment of sixth grade graduates in 2008 before they entered into secondary school. And then we did a follow-up of this cohort, regardless of whether or not they enrolled in school in 2009 and in 2010. So it's a very rigorous research methodology um, quantitatively. And then we were actually able to also embed qualitative research in eight of these communities, four were SAT communities and four were SEB communities. And as you can imagine, this opened up a whole line of work for me um, that because there were so many interesting um, things that we learned through this longitudinal design. It's, it's very rare and we were really lucky to have the resources to do this. So, um, so this is kind of a visual of how we did the data collection um, with a baseline, a qualitative, a first follow-up, uh, another follow-up, and then a, a second round of qualitative. And then I also added within this, this second phase, we had, again, more um, a qualitative and quantitative in, uh, uh, instruments that we applied and interviews that we conducted. And luckily, at this time of this second round of research, I had a student um, named Becca Sharef, who was very interested in agricultural education and in garden, garden based education, actually, is what we often called it. She had worked in Nicaragua extensively um, on garden, garden based education. And so she actually did a study, which I'll say a little bit more today as a part of this um, uh, phase of the research. So there's a lot that I could say actually about the findings and what the standard deviations were and what the, the main findings were in, in, um, in 2010. But what I will say is that we had a very positive um, outcome that even brought the attention of the Brookings Institution, a big think tank in Washington, DC. They said um, they highlight SAT as this model for secondary schooling in rural areas. And they say that as global problems continue to grow more complex and indiscriminate about geography, this kind of transformative learning model will be ever more relevant in mobilizing rural youth in the creation of more sustainable communities. So very interesting um, you know, uh, attention to, to SAT at this stage. 
And so we then moved on to do an, another follow-up study where we were looking at a focus of quality. So what is it about this program that makes it so innovative and trying to unpack some of these very uh, various elements. So we're looking at the system-wide features of the SAT program that explain these quality outcomes the effects of quality education as youth transition to adulthood. So this actually, the second question is where all of my interest came in early marriage and the prevention of early marriage and early pregnancy um, in rural Honduras. So I'm gonna skip over this quickly, um, but I do wanna share a bit of the deep dive uh, of what we learned here about how SAT improves um, learning outcomes with the focus on agriculture. And if you skip ahead in the slideshow itself, you'll see Becca, a link to Becca's dissertation and also a link to her conclusions. So um, this is just a quick uh, map of Honduras to show you where in these two regions we conducted this research. And one of the things that was really great is that we were able to observe the uh, teacher training in their training center. Um, and so some of the pictures that you'll see come from this teacher training center in Comayagua, Honduras. So um, there was a lot that came through this, but I think one of the most important themes, and again, I'm gonna go over the slides very quickly so that we have lots of time for interaction. You can scroll through and read all of the um, text and all of our notes. Um, but one of the most important things is what we learned about the, the saliency of these texts, um, the texts in the SAP program. So um, there, there's a, a few kind of super important themes that learning is happening through conversations and engagement with the texts. Um, and so all of these slides are sort of structured so that you can see sort of where the differences were um, between the SEB program and the SAT program that has a kind of clear, well-established syllabus with these texts that are at the core. And, you know, the texts were developed over a period of uh, of really decades from Fundac. They're still using these texts that Fundac developed, and many of them, again, have this very strong agricultural focus. Um, so, and, and this is, you know, the, the idea is that the text is facilitating a conversation. Um, and the tutors themselves are trained to implement these texts. So they're trained specifically in the content that they'll be working with, with students, which is very rare. Again, um, usually teacher training is much more theoretical, um, and that the curriculum was created for the context of rural communities in Latin America. And so, uh, for example, one tutor said, we integrate the community with a technology project. We talk to the students about things they know. It adapts to the reality in which they live. Um, and so, you know, this is where you can see an example of how tutors are generating local examples to problems in the text to create more community relevance. Here, they're working on on a food web activity used um, to, to, to use animals in the local ecosystem. So the trainings and activities are, are very interactive and very much focused on trying to use local knowledge to better understand the reality in which students live. Um, and uh, this is really this idea that learning is happening through conversation. And we have lots of examples of that where, again, a tutor said, we try to use um, commented reading, which is called lectura comentada. A student reads, we discuss what he, she read, what each one understood, we expand. Then another student reads at the end of it and the exercises of amplia ampliación are made individually and we discuss them together. So you can see this pedagogy, which you're probably quite used to if you've participated in some uh, you know, similar learning exercises from the Ruhi Institute. Um, and then we have, you know, the idea of the curriculum quality, uh, the students, and this is a SAT student talking about, they actually do the entire JY, uh, the junior youth texts as part of their, um, as part of their curriculum. The tutors uh, who are not Baha'is, like very few of the people involved in the implementation of SAT in Honduras are Baha'is, but many people talk about the spiritual component and say how important and integral it is to the students learning. So here is a tutor who's praising the interdisciplinarity of the text, their connection with spirituality and human values. So they say the brisas, breezes of confirmation and walking the straight path, talk about reaching dreams, not giving up. Although sometimes they have economic problems, they should not stop studying, but make an effort. If they try hard, there will always be open doors. Achieving good things is hard, but it can be done. There is no impossible task. Um, so the... 
you know, again, we we have um, the the connections between SAT re and the SEB. So in the SEB, you have uh, instability, unsuitability, unavailability, um, and you know the, the focus here is on implementation and quality. So those are the kinds of ways in which we see uh, differences. And then this idea that that um, learning is happening beyond the classroom. So it's not just about what happens in the classroom, but in the school and in the community. And of course, agriculture is a key component of this and work on agricultural products. So as one sat tutor said, with a technology text, it depends on the class. If it says a subsystem, then we have to sew. It's very nice because students learn to work in the field. Um, and this is, again, where you see how these capabilities are connected. So all of it's connected to service to the community, the mathematical capabilities, the technological capabilities, scientific language and communication. Um, all the SAT tutors reported various academic activities that occur outside of the classroom. And most of that was conducting surveys and interviews with community members and work on agricultural projects. Um, and you can see some of the ways in which this uh, field work unfolds in the different pictures that are a part of the um, a part of the presentation today. I also definitely recommend that you go and have a look at Fundac's website. There's a lot of great documents there about how the SAT program was created, the core concepts, um, and uh, and and it's a much more in-depth. I'm just gonna stop sharing to, to say hello and <laughs> make sure you're you're here with me. Um, and then if there is time, I'm happy to go more in depth on um, Rebecca Sharef's dissertation, which was really about science education. It was an immersive field study of teaching and training in the Honduran SAT program with a focus specifically on two of the texts that are studied. One is on um, raising chickens, and then the other is on um, has a has the focus on um, on agriculture as well. So I see a couple of questions. So I, I think it would be great to. Um, I think Leo even had his hand up, so it might be that he wants to. Oh, great! And Mark put in the uh, um, the link. To, thank you so much, Mark, for putting that in the chat. The link to Fundaec, and again, there's a bunch of hyperlinks within the um, within the presentation itself. And thank you, um, Bakira Judith from Uganda. Oh, yes. And thank you for joining us from Uganda because there's a whole, um, we could say, another chapter of this unfolding in Uganda that I've had the pleasure of, of being involved with as well. So I'm, I'm really, um, I know you recently had the, a presentation from Uganda. Um, and so this, this is very much connected to, to the work that's happening there as well. Right. I wonder it wondered if Leo Leo did have his hand up earlier. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if you wanted yeah. to make a comment, Leo. No, I will wait for Aaron to finish so I can finish a little bit with our agriculture proposal of Funda. Okay. Okay. I'm finished for now. But I'd love to hear from others before we I mean it's a it would be nice to get your questions or your comments or reactions and and then maybe Well, it might be good to kind of back up a little bit and ask Leo if he could describe just a little bit about the origins of Fundiac. What what does Fundiac stand for? There may be people on here that aren't even familiar with, with Fundiac. And Richard, you look like you have your hands up as well. Mm -hmm. well okay, I, I would say that uh, Fundiac really is, the, the, the name is that for foundation for the teaching and application of the of sciences. Right. And, That's when, it. and and when can you give us just a little background on when it started and how it you started in, in in 1970s. Yes. Uh, I joined from the Dr. Prabal invited me to work with him in 1977. Yes, and I joined the whole group. Uh, oh. I was there just for one year. And I left to be a pioneer in Costa Rica. But when I went back to Colombia, he invited me again to join <laughs> Fundae. Uh, and I worked many, many years in Fundae. The important thing is how did it start? Really, uh, when uh, he, Dr. Abad was 
is, is a nuclear physicist, and he was working in a public university of Colombia. He quit his job working at, at the Livermore Particle Accelerator in California, and with a, a completely different salary, <laughs> he came down to Colombia and become a teacher in, in a public university. <laughs> and uh, he got, when the, the Abichov, Archibichov opposed to the Fed in the, in the slums of Cali, then he uh, uh, invited a group of professors, non many of them, or most of them, to put in a big matrix all the contents that a big university has to address the needs of the rural areas of Latin America. That's the way they put down the curriculum in Asia. And they started a, a lot of uh, conversation about the philosophical approach. They agree, all of them agree that they won't uh, apply any of the ideologies that are serving to oppress, human, to oppress humanity today. It was completely, and the, the, the current president, this is a very important thing that I'm gonna mention. There were people from all political backgrounds, professors of university, and different religious perspectives, etc. Let me share with you something very important. Uh, one of these uh, uh, professors belonged to an ideological group that uh, was became later on a guerrilla group. And they killed, this group killed the Supreme Court of Colombia. Dr. Abad warned him and told him that that was not the path to be followed, that it should be peaceful. He lost the leg. Later on, they made peace with the government. The current president of Colombia, who was in prison when they killed the Supreme Court, used to belong to that group. And now he has opened up the doors to advancing greatly the agricultural approach in Colombia. I mean, he's suspending a lot of importations of food. They say to feed the poor and the children, we should not import food from other countries. And he's a strengthening the rural sector in, in a great way. Leo, I want to just chime in and say, I think it's so interesting that you mentioned this because I think one of the important tasks will be to try to capture this rich history um, I think they're trying to do some work because I think what's so interesting from, you know, this initiative started in the late, uh, you know, really late 70s, early 80s and has been ongoing for a number of years. And, um, you know, there's so many rich details that I hope as a as a scholarly community, we we can make sure to uh, to rescue so that we get this rich history. Richard, I want to hear your question. Uh, yes, I, I've been very interested in this program for several years and uh, talking with people maybe who have been uh, directly affiliated with it or from a distance and have read many of the academic papers, the master's and PhD programs, but um, I like to be able to take whatever information that we can learn <laughs> from a field and to be able to apply it locally, to read the reality of our local areas and say, okay, how can we take information that so many years of hard work and effort have been put in, how do we apply that at our local levels? And so um, I've spent a lot of time searching and looking for uh, these texts in English, cannot find anywhere. I uh, have spoken with people um, who, again, directly or indirectly have been involved in the program in Spanish. Um, but so my question is, is are the programs available in English? Mm -hmm. Are there are there tutor trainings um, beyond the junior youth text specific to the SAT program that one can be trained in? And if so, where and how can that be accomplished? What a great question. Thank you so much for asking that. 
So I think, um, uh, you know, we have um, the case now where, so essentially there's a, a treasure trove of texts, as you, as you say. The majority are in Spanish. Some have been translated to English. Uh, they're not available online. So Fundac has copyrighted these texts and um, is a little bit hesitant, I would say, to share them in part because um, there's a lot of borrowing in the field of education and uh, pieces of this can be used and quite frankly, misused. And we've, I've seen many examples of it in throughout my, um, my work in this field. So for example, I was hired uh, by the Ministry of Education of Peru to do a consultancy in Peru, and they wanted to get advice about how to organize their secondary uh, alternative secondary education programs. And they said, we have this program and it's called it was called Tutoria Secundaria. Like it was like almost sat. It was called Tutorial Secondary. And when I started reading all of the information about it, literally they had copied and pasted components of Fundayek's uh, philosophy and um, you know, uh, theoretical framework. They had literally taken it from Fundayek and used it, but they actually weren't using all of the, the whole system, right? So I think the idea is that there's a system that has a lot of coherence and to take one or two elements of this system is not necessarily going to be advantageous or effective and could really, you know, it's, it's almost like there's a brand, you know, just like there's a brand that needs to be preserved. And, and there's still a lot of learning that's being done by Fundac about what um, kinds of applications of these um, components of the of the system could be potentially, uh, you know, appropriate in different contexts. And so I think what's been learned is that context really matters and that um, the folks at Fundayek have now begun to experiment with the um, use of some of these texts. Like, so for example, in Uganda, um, now Kimanya in Geo uh, is using some of the texts to do teacher training. So they're not using the entire system of texts that were developed for secondary schooling, but rather a subset of those texts to do teacher trainings. Uh, so I think the, the learning now, and I can't speak on Fundayek's behalf, but it's my understanding that there is now an openness to using texts for uh, alternative purposes if the context lends itself to those. So I think what's important to recognize is that these texts were created for rural communities in low income settings. And so depending on what community you're in, it might be that they're just not really deemed appropriate for use in say, you know, Berkeley, California or, uh, you know, Boston, Massachusetts or wherever we may find ourselves. And so the text exists, some of them do exist in English, um, whether or not they could be used outside of the, um, the you know, settings that they've been approved for is would definitely be a question for, uh, for Fundec. Thank you. Uh Hey, yes. Richard or anybody, whoever is interested in ordering these books, I can forward you the information where to order them. Uh, I see a hand from Elga. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm still in my morning mood, so you'll not be seeing my video <laughs> yet. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really so happy to to hear your presentation, Erin. Uh, uh, I'm a student, I'm, an, I'm a doctorate student right now in applied learning at the University of Miami, and I'm getting ready to do my capstone project. And so anything that has to do with learning is uh, really sparks my interest. I am a kind of a student of von Dyke, and I have gone through a lot of the last Lessons, learning programs, uh, courses, almost all of them I have. I have done them. Uh, I've done part of the PSA as well. And um, so, uh, yeah, so this kind of thing really interests me. But uh, you've answered kind of part of my question, which is how do you use, how can you incorporate parts of the Fond Dyke program in? In say a project, for example, that I, I want to develop, or do I have to use all the breadth of it? So is it the breadth of it, or you, can you use part of it? And, and you have answered them, you have answered it a little bit. But I also am feeling like 
where do I, how can I get training? So I'm, I'm, in, I'm a student, of course, of the institute process, which I think is, which I think if you, someone can also explain the relationship of all these pieces, the PSA, the institute process, and, and, and all of this, you know, and the, and the, the secondary training as well. Um, someone can explain how all of those, that piece together, you know, I'm sure most of us here are Baha'is. So we understand what we're saying when we say the institute process and the methodology with it. Um, yeah, where was that going? I kind of lost my train of thought. <laughs> kind of. Anyway, yeah, if I if I think about something else, I would I'll come up with it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's so exciting to hear all the training that you've already done. Uh, so I I can speak a little bit to the, to this question. So I, I guess my 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 thinking about whether you know an interest in using these in, in your context or in a particular way. I think you would just need to send a proposal to Fundaec and, you know, there's contact information on their site. But I think, you know, if you were to say I'm, I'm working in this context and I'm thinking about potentially using this and entering into a dialogue um, about that potential use, I think it's it's not that they're trying to, you know, kind of guard this information, but just making sure that it's used and and also just the capacity for training, as you say, um, you know, can be limited. So so the, the programs are interconnected. So you have Fundaec. Fundac is, I, I think of as like the hub for what has been um, really a process of scaling educational innovation throughout the world. So there's, um, and, and, and I think maybe this will be my next book project, which is to think about Fundac and scaling innovation, um, because there's a lot of uh, discussion right now about how do we scale innovation in a number of different fields, but in particular in the field of education is this idea that uh, we have these pockets of innovation that unfold. We know that we can make systemic change and transformative change, but how do you scale that? Um, and scaling is not just about reaching greater and greater numbers, but about this question of adaptation to local context and learning and remixing. We can think of this also as remixing um, and adapting. And so what's so fascinating to me about this case study of Fundaec is that we see this um, application in the context of Honduras. And we've learned a lot about this through Becca's study on uh, on the agricultural components and environmental education. And we've learned about the gender impacts from some of my work. We have other, you know, as, um, as Richard was mentioning, a lot of master's theses, PhD theses have been written on, on Fundax programming. So we're learning a lot about, you know, why they're so innovative and why they're so effective. But also there's been this adaptation not just in terms of SAT and SAT to the Honduran context, but this recognition by Fundaec that formalizing the SAT program came with trade-offs. So in becoming a formal offering that was connected to the government, there were government requirements that had to be met. And this made the essence of what uh, Fundaec was trying to do with this alternative innovative program, it, it um, in some ways, uh, created some rigidity around like how the curriculum was delivered, um, you know, how much innovation could take place because there's all these requirements for being a formal secondary school program in the context of, uh, of Honduras. So, um, and the same thing happened in Colombia that with, you know, increased uh, recognition, government recognition, the trade-off was that some of the um, the the learning for the sake of learning and some of the original intention through which um, Funda created this initiative, some of that was was lost because of the formality. And so Funda launched the Preparation for Social Action program, which uses the same texts, but it uses only the first, I think, of, you know, in the SAT program, there's almost 70 texts. And I think PSA is only using, you know, one uh, subset of those texts. So PSA has then, uh, you know, we've translated those texts through, um, I think they got funding from Canada to do this translation, and the PSA texts are used, um, you know, around, around the globe for the Preparation for Social Action program. And now you mentioned also Elga Laszlo's. So Laszlo's is an online learning platform, and um, Fundac has developed a series of uh, texts that are really the training of the trainers. So it's almost like a master's level series of courses that can be used to train people who will be coordinators of PSA, um, to train this kind of upper tier 
of professionals who will be involved in doing training and doing oversight and in doing accompaniment of these different initiatives. And those have been uh, brought online. And so there's an opportunity to study some of those modules through uh, through last most learning. So a lot of overlap in the texts that have been created. Um, and again, a lot of overlap in the conceptual framework of these uh, different um, initiatives uh, because of this idea of adapting uh, and using some of the, the rich materials that were that were um, written by some of these pioneers of this um, method that, that Leo had the opportunity to work with. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was so comprehensive. <laughs> so this slide. When the government accepts this as a formal program of education for secondary or rural areas, there are extreme number of regulations. So that's why Fundaev decided let's put this as, a, as an informal process of education, informal system of education because the formalities of the ministries of education in the world are too extreme. I mean, you are you end up working <laughs> to fill reports and this and that, it's too much. We don't need that much to be a successful program of education. Yeah. Um, Aaron, I think there are a few questions in the chat. Yes. Uh, so the question is, uh, can we hear more about the uni rural university? And is it the same as uh, the President SAP program? Thank you so much, uh, Winona, for this brilliant question. So Fonda created a uni rural university to train the teachers. And, um, and it was a four-year university. And unfortunately, the same process unfolded at the level of the rural university, as we saw uh, with the secondary program in Colombia, where as the Colombian government passed more and more regulations for universities to become accredited, Fundayak lost its accreditation as a rural university, decided to not pursue accreditation mm -hmm. because it would have had to be publishing peer reviewed papers. And, you know, they had a number of requirements, you know, getting external funding for research and their purpose as a rural university did not align with the government's vision of what a university was. It was a, a different vision and it wasn't feasible um, really to, to, to kind of preserve the mission of Fundayak in generating local knowledge and not just um, thinking about, you know, the traditional forms of academic knowledge that, that universities um, prioritize. And so Fundayak essentially closed the rural university. So the rural university is no longer in existence but again, the materials that were used for the rural university continue to be exist and to be used in other contexts. Um, with regards to who's developing these courses today, Fundaek continues to be the developer of the courses and any new materials. And then with regards to whether it would be uh, possible to have access to PSA books. So PSA is actually really interesting in that Fundaek um, has passed along responsibility for PSA to the Baha'i Office of Social uh, in economic development. I, I'm getting that wrong. It's the Baha'i Development Office, BDO. Does someone else know? I forget the new acronym. Baha'i mm -hmm. International Isn't Development that? Organization. Yeah. BDO. 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 Thank you. I knew I was wrong. <laughs> I have trouble with new acronyms. So, yes. So, BDO. So, BDO is responsible for PSA. And so that would be the an entity to write to um, see if you could get access to the to the um, PSA books. And Funda continues to be a partner in uh, in that work, but that uh, Bido is is now officially the one that is overseeing because it has spread globally. So, um, and that's great. So Christine, thanks for joining us. While you could, it's nice to to meet you. And um, and yes, it's uh, any other questions you can feel free to reach out to me. I mean, there's no one can ask one one last question and then I want to ask another one. Um, so and and this is around the the terminology today of internet the terminology of international education. Um, yeah, I'll 
I'd like you to speak a bit more about um, number one, where is the the <laughs> the thought the thought, you know, um what is in the the thought the thought leaders today in education? What does that even what does that look like? Because yeah. I I know international education, I mean uh currently <laughs> most of the popular thought really means a deviation from Western education. Mm -hmm. That's when you call international education. So when we when you use it in in terms of fundamental programs and uh, and of course the SAT program. So what 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 does that look like? Is that the same terminology? Should we be using that terminology in the first place? That's a great question. Thank you so much. So I I kind of say like that I'm in this field because the the professional association I've done most of my like work with and the journals that I've published with are um, connected to the Comparative and International Education Society. Um, which is the acronym is CIES, and you can find their um, web page and search the like conference programs. And so, you know, there's been a group of Baha'is who have worked loosely in this field and presented at this conference uh, for a number of years. In fact, um, Dr. Hale Arbab, uh, who is one of the, um, you know, kind of uh, founding members of Fundac, she's been connected with Fundac for quite some time. She got her PhD at UMass. Uh, Amherst in in international education. I got my my degrees in international education. Um, Bita Correa, who's Halle and Gustavo's daughter, is finishing her PhD at the University of Toronto in international education. So a number of us have um, have worked in this field. But I think your question is beyond uh, answering. You know, in the context of this talk this morning, but it's a good one. And and I think we do find that it, it is a discourse community that is open to learning from the experience of Fundac. And that's why many of us are working within this field. Is that we feel that Fundac Fundac's programs, SAT, PSA, um, you know, the experience in Uganda. These are kind of people who are searching for something different from the Western model. And there's been a lot of receptivity within that community. So when Winona um, has, say, has said that um, uh, we should hear a bit from, uh, from Neil, which I think would be wonderful because it turns out that Neil um, also has some experience in, uh, in, the, in implementing this program, but in Costa Rica. So I didn't mention that it's, um, you know, components of SAT are offered in, in Costa Rica and in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in Ecuador. Um, you know, we have a number of really fascinating examples of how uh, FundaX materials have been used in different contexts. And I, I would love to hear from, hear from Neil. Is Neil still with us? I think he had to leave because he's on the Wilmette faculty too. Oh, okay. But his stories of uh, Costa Rica were part of uh, the learning that some of us had to feel so engaged in understanding Fundiac. So sorry about that one. Oh, no problem. I'm sorry you had to leave. I wish I had been stopped talking sooner. <laughs> Aaron, I was wondering, um, since we, we do have some more time here, if you could talk about in Uganda, some of the teacher and gardening, teacher gardening training um, that you had mentioned earlier, you weren't sure you're gonna have time to discuss that, but that's, I think people would find that really fascinating. I'm happy to. So, you know, so essentially what has happened is um, there's a there's a, a, a Baha'i inspired uh, organization there called Kimanya Ngeo. It was started, um, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago. And uh, over time, just like in Honduras, the focus and mission of Kimanya has changed slightly. Um, but Kimanya was actually uh, a, a big push for starting Kimanya was to begin to experiment with the uh, materials that Fundayak had created in the Ugandan context. And so back in the, you know, really like uh, 2009, 2010, um, a group in Uganda was trying to use uh, the similar model of working with youth and bringing um, what would have been a kind of modified version of the SAP program to the Ugandan context. And pretty early on, they, they realized that it wasn't going to be, um, it wasn't going to work. And it wasn't going to work because the school day is very, very long. Um, and so, so youth didn't have a lot of free time. 
And there were not a lot of youth that were out of school and wanting to participate and they didn't have formal recognition and there was very high levels of dropout and there was a lot of saturation within the communities in which they were working. So they decided instead, um, the quality of education is very, very low in Uganda where you know most students in fourth grade still can't read and write a simple sentence. They have very, very rudimentary arithmetic skills. The quality of teachers is very, very low. And so um, Kimanya saw this opportunity to use the materials that were developed that were intended for uh, students and also that were created by the rural university in Fundak to, to create a program of teacher professional development for primary and secondary schools. And um, that initiative, uh, you know, sp speeding this up um, by, by about a decade uh, is well underway. They've gotten uh, several grants, uh, research grants to, to do that, to do this teacher training. And a brilliant economist um, who is now based at the University of Chicago, and he's wor working with a Nobel Prize winning economist in the field of economics. Uh, he has done an uh, impact evaluation, a randomized control trial, studying the effectiveness of this teacher training program in Uganda, and has found that it has a very significant effect on student learning outcomes. And so they asked me to begin to collaborate to do some qualitative research to understand the process through which this has uh, unfolded. And interestingly, in the midst of this, we had the COVID-19 pandemic where um, you know, there was a kind of you know, very um, uh, difficult circumstances, both for teachers and for, for students. And so at that time, Kimanya actually decided, and Fundaek as well did this, they decided to really emphasize home gardens and um, production of uh, food, food production for the family because people were really facing um, challenging economic circumstances. And so um, I have come in to, um, examine a, a series of qualitative interviews that were conducted with people who participated in this intervention in um, Uganda. And what's so fascinating, and if you give me just a moment, I can actually pull up some of the some of this data, some of the excerpts of this qualitative uh, data on um, agriculture. What we're finding to be so interesting is the way in which agriculture has such a um, really, it, it's like a foundational and uh, transformative role in the way in which people speak about their, uh, their experience in these trainings. So it's, it's like the, the, the integration of agriculture is not just about um, earning a little bit of extra income, but as an analogy, right? So uh, it's an, an analogy for what teachers do with their students. So for example, they'll say, you know, we think if we think of these children like plants, you have to water the plant. You have to make sure the plant has plenty of sun. You have to make sure that it has nutrients in the soil. Um, and as the teacher, that's my responsibility to be ten tending these plants. Um, so, so the teachers talk about the gardens, not just as a way for them uh, to, to be, uh, you know, have extra income during these challenging times, but through the experience of gardening and working in the gardens that these analogies about their role as teachers take place. So I can share um, one, one teacher, for example, said, being in Kimanya has helped me to come closer to the child. Formerly, teachers would not entertain children to come near them. Um, so that you isolate yourself, but because I learned that a child should come near you so the child will fear at home. We learned that a child is like a garden and what I teach are seeds being planted in soil, that I'm getting the seeds in that soil. Who is the child? And therefore I should bring that child to myself so that the child will be able to express himself or herself freely. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of, when we talk to the teachers about their experience, you know, they're, they're talking about agriculture in these extremely interesting ways. So another one said, um, when they talked about agriculture, we do agriculture at home. They talked about science in everyday life. 
uh, we move with science. I was happy when I came back. I came back changed. And this is, you know, from the training. Things they're talking about are the very things we do at home. For example, when they're talking about agriculture, how we prepare for the garden, for planting. So I realized in my brain that the garden they're talking about in class or the school is the school. So when you pick what they're talking on or which they're saying, it is the, the things of daily life. So it's been a very, very rich context to better understand the transformative nature of this um, experience that folks have in, in teacher training. Yeah, so that reminds me of, you know, the famous quote that we have on our, our website that, that agriculture is the, is the fundamental basis of the community. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and it serves as this incredibly rich analogy for education as well. Right. Uh, Leo? Yes. Uh, give me a second. Um, sure. uh, I would like to continue with, with, the, with the presentation of the agriculture and agroindustry proposal of Fundareg. If that is okay with you, Aaron? Yes, I just want to let everyone know that unfortunately I do have to leave soon because I have some child care responsibilities today. So um, so I, I will have to leave in just a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh... so let me continue with this. Just a, a little bit of, of, of the education of Pundai. A 13 year old boy or girl, seven or eight grader, are protagonists in social in society's building process. In a textbook for seven graders, health and aspect of well being, adolescents participate in a village gathering to share with them data collected about nine ill health determinants and suggest proposals to deal with them. I mean, they go and they ask how many children are in this house. They write down the name, the age, and they ask the parent or the person taking care of him or her if he has had parasites, intestinal parasites. Then they share a whole lesson, a, a, a series of contents about how we get infected how big is the damage being caused in the, of the body and how to prevent the situation. And in another lesson, they will ask permission to count how many flies there are in the kitchen. In the tropics, we don't have window panes. We just open the, the window panes and just the air comes in. Yeah. So when they counted the the flies on, 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 on the, and this is very high on the Andes. And there were only eight students in the, in the, in the sad group. And they, and they, each student has to visit five households. And when they bring the numbers to the classroom, how many flies they have counted in the different uh, families, 40 families more or less, uh, 40 households, they decided to invite the parents and to form uh, and to schedule a visit with the a health official of the big town close to the village. The problem was that they have located the dump right next to this village. And they shared the numbers and the, 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 the parents who were visited were present and they said, yeah, they came here in my home, and they counted 12, 12 flies on my kitchen. So that is empowering. But at the end of the of the of, of, of the whole unit about health and aspect of well-being, they uh, the, the students uh, suggest measures or, or different uh, proposals to address all nine health, ill health determinants. And that is very powerful. If there is a public health uh, graduate 
or a social worker present besides the, the besides the, the unit you group animator, then it really becomes a very interesting process. And they are they they have examined what they will do with one hundred thousand dollars, with ten thousand dollars, or with eighty thousand dollars. So they know that they have to adapt the response to the ill health determinants to whatever budget is available for that village. So this is the kind of empowerment that Hyundai has. Now let me share with you the agricultural proposal of Hyundai. The way of organizing the polyculture crops in the plot was based on the Afro-Colombian farmer's tradition that serve as a foundation for the agricultural research of Hyundai. The small farmers all over the world have polycultures. So Hyundai decided to do research about this. And of course, Martin Prager, which is a brilliant uh, agronomist, follow up these experiments for years. When you mix corn with beans with cassava, the principles of local food security, the agronomic principles and the arrangements of crops in science, time and space. When to plan each one of these. And you, you will see here when the, when the beans, when you harvest the beans, you will plant a, how do you call this? Zapallo in, 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 in Espanol, in English. Uh, uh, another crop of the floor with big leaves. Uh, the three sisters of the indigenous population were beans, maize, and squash. A squash, yes. You you plant a squash in the in, in to cover the to cover the to serve as a, as a cover crop to avoid the heating of the land and the dryness of it, yes? So you scale all of these other crops as the time goes by until the cassava comes out. We will take many months, yeah? So that's the idea with all of these things. So that's the kind of research that Hyundai did. But now the, the, the new temple in Colombia has a big piece of land and the research is to recover the forest native to that valley. It's a huge valley, like 20, 30 miles wide by 100 miles. And today is planted in sugarcane. So the proposal of the research proposal of, of, of the temple is go into a research, and it has started already about agroforestry. When you mix bananas, a climber, annual crash crops, a small fruit trees, and not a fruit trees. So that is more a wood trees. So this is the kind of research that is being done now. If you look at the book of Regenesis in page 106, Tolis Farms has 100 different species. And it's not a big farm. But he is dealing with this in a very complex and systematic way. And in, in the last five years, uh, before the, this book was published, he, he has doubled his guilt with every inch of the soil is covered with something. And there is a lot of microorganisms in the soil. So this is the kind of, of systems that will compete with the monoculture prevailing today in the world. And of course, this is based in the principles of unity and diversity on diversity for the Baha'i faith. Fundayek also did some research about the storehouse. Yeah. At the beginning, it was just providing the farmers with different tools and whatever they needed for the crops. And 
uh, and for the households. Well, of course, uh, uh, one of the of, of the needs that was identified about the storehouse is the process to preserve crops from spoiling. If you really read closely to the writings about uh, the, the storehouse, some kind of, if you are going to buy the crops, you need to process them in order to prevent the spoiling of them. In Kundai, there was four plants, of agroindustrial plants. Look at this phrase from Dr. about, about agroindustry. The flow of two products from one operation to the other and the sharing of facilities are among the factors that make the center an economic and viable enterprise, providing the rural university with a model that promises to be an important structure possibly to be replicated in every group of four to five field villages. So if you have a storehouse in, on each village and there are and they share this uh, agri agroindustry part with a small processing plant. There are no huge plants that we are used to in, in the US. And they can share the benefits of processing the whatever is bought at the at the storehouse. So there was a plant for concentrated food for animals, a food processing plant, a plant for uh, processing soy, and a bakery. So, and this was part of the research being done in Pundai. Let me see. I'm so glad you're, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were still speaking. Go ahead, go ahead, Leo. Okay, let me finish now. To hear an idea of how important agriculture is for the progress of the Fed, let us silently reflect on the prestige of the Ruhi Institute was the result of its link to its twin institution, Kundaek, and its pursuit and its pursuit of unity in science and religion. I want you guys to read these quotes in here in silence, and then I will have. I have two more slides to talk to you about it. We just have six minutes left, I think, Leo, just as an FYI. Okay. Yeah, I will give you one minute to, to in silence, read those quotes. Thank you, Leo. Those are, those are all quotes that I think many of us are, are very familiar with. Okay, perfect. We quote them all the time to people. <laughs> okay, perfect. They're beautiful. Okay. Really the heart. The teamwork makes the dream work. All Fundaic professors held unity of thought in their research projects to build a curriculum for secondary education. So all professors, were focused on building a curriculum for secondary education. I have a suggestion for the agricultural work to do. Should we form reading groups committed to writing PowerPoint presentations and courses to empower union groups? Let us meet to define the greatest need of a strategy. Finally, I would like to share with you this. Uh, this is my new book, The Single Science, a new edition. And I'm talking about seven different methods of science. The idea with this is let's teach them in the context of the potential of biodiversity to generate employment in the world. to replace the construction industry 
which is defined as the engine of the economy of the Western world. And how to do this? Let's empower the girls, the sons, the daughters and the sons of the farmers of the world and the youth of the world in general to learn the, the method of science in the context of the potential of biodiversity. And then they can take those methods to apply to any collective or personal need, aspiration, problem, etc. That's it. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, did you have something you wanted to I say? just see Neil, that Neil has had his hand up for quite some time and Winona put her hand up at one point as well. So I wasn't sure if it was intentional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll just take a minute. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you both, um, Leo and Erin. <clears throat> I'm more of a philosopher. Um, I, I went to Cambridge um, back in the day. It's just this I want to share with the group. The meaning of the word campus is actually field. And I think in the future, uni universities are going to have their campus as like a sacred space where people are going to see the growth of plants and the beauty of this, you know, terrestrial endowment. And that in the future that agriculture pedagogically, the study of agriculture is going to have a huge impact on pedagogy as a whole. Thank you. Neil. Thank you. And um, Winnie, did you have something? I'll just uh, reinforce, I think, what Leo has showed us is that agriculture is a much wider field than many people think, and it depends on the systems of the world. And so if we're going to reconstruct our world, uh, we have to recognize that economics and health and all these uh, disciplines are part of uh, creating a world with agriculture at its center. Thank you. So we're talking about 300,000 sec, secondary metabol metabolites in the plant kingdom. Each one of them with potentialities for industry, for agriculture, for medicine, for nutrition, etc. One million species of insects. If you go to a Congress of Entomology, they talk about a few scores of beneficial insects. We don't know the function of the rest. There is an estimate between one trillion to 10 trillion species of microorganisms. Penicillin is one of them. The vastness of research to be done is huge. That's what I'm proposing. Let's empower the youth of the world with the method of science. All right. All right, everyone. I think Aaron needs to go now. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, Lee, did you have a? Yeah, I just had a quick um, thing and, I, and someone in this group and there may have been a couple of folks in this group had gotten together and started drafting a little um, I guess kind of workbook for junior youth around agriculture understanding agriculture and I think I mean I'm, I'm still doing a lot of work with with junior youth and um, I think there could be a, there is a real need for just some basic insights and, and guidance for animators to help junior youth groups who want to start a garden and, you know, to be able to be successful. Um, I think a lot of junior youth groups have been kind of hit and miss when it comes to, to gardening, but I think there's a lot of interest in there. And, and obviously, as we just heard, a lot of value in centering um, educational inquiry around uh, the act of gardening, gardening and the metaphors of gardening. So it, I don't know if there's a, if there's interest in and capacity, I think it would be a beautiful service to be able to put together a little bit of supplementary material that that animators could use 
to engage their junior youth in in creating, you know, communal farm, communal gardens, family gardens, you know, whatever. The school gardens too. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Uh, um, I, I've got a thought on responding to what Leah just said. Um, we could have a um, a website or a, just a whole support system built so that gardeners won't fail when they start. So that, uh, you know, when they have questions or there could be somebody that can give them the guidance they need, but not to put them out there by themselves where they mm -hmm. won't have the support they need. Yes, that's exactly it. Yes. All right, anyone else? Any other thoughts before we finish today? So I so, want to thank you so much, Leo and, um, and Aaron. Aaron, unfortunately, had to go. Um, we want to thank you both. <clears throat> it was wonderful really um, demystifying Fundiac for us. So many of us have had questions and and um, I think you've, you've answered a lot of them for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Don and the Recorder Working Group for inviting us to join our experiences. This was just a glimpse of it. There mm -hmm. is so much more to learn. Of course. And and I am very thankful to my professors at Fundaek and the Ruhi Institute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I learned a lot from them. Yes. What is our next uh, program, Dawn? Do you want to mention it? Yeah. Um, so our May program, of course, you know, we always meet on the last Sunday of each month. Uh, the next program is going to be uh, Gary Roche. And he's going to talk about some of the issues of, and some of the ways that people in Ukraine have been dealing with agriculture. As we're you know, well aware, many farmers have been disrupted there. And so people have had to, had to, to work, look at you know, alternative methods of agriculture there. And, and also in terms of community support, refugees and all that. So he's going to be with us um, at the end of May, the last Sunday in May. So we'll look forward, we're looking forward to that. Let's end up saying a prayer for Ukraine and Russia. Yes. Yes. Would you like to say a prayer? Would someone like to say a prayer? Yeah. Del libro de las dificultades, salvo de Dios. Diga alabado sea Dios. Él es Dios. Todos somos sus siervos. Y todos nos atenemos a su mandato. 